Welcome to the stream. Woohoo! Hopefully ad free now. Um, we had to upgrade the live stream account literally three minutes before the con started because otherwise everyone got ads. Uh, anyway, welcome to uh, yet another talk. Um, Dave is going to talk about something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm a big fan. If anybody follows me on Twitter, I get a little grumpy when the press gets attacked, uh, both kind of physically, in any way, really. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of freedom of the press. I think it's a pretty uh, unique characteristic of our society. Uh, I do what I can to defend it and also support it. Um, I may kill a few trees in the process, though. I have newspapers that show up every day uh, at my end of my driveway, and I try to subscribe online. I would encourage other people to do so as well. Um, we have uh, less and less press than we've had in the past, and whether you agree or disagree at times with what they write, I think it's important to defend their right to exist and support it however possible, especially in our economy where most shit's free. Uh, they still need to get paid. So uh, Dave is going to talk about um, attacks against the press, uh, and I encourage you to kind of reflect upon the importance of uh, the freedom of the press in our open society. Well, so with that, turn it over to David. Thanks, Bruce. No so hi, welcome. Uh, so I'm just going to really quickly go through all the kind of background, context, biography stuff. Uh, I'm with Freedom of the Press Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco in New York uh, that does a few different things. Uh, my team, uh, along with my colleagues Harlow Holmes and Olivia Martin, are the digital security training team. We help journalists learn how to not get hacked. Uh, and a little bit will come out of that today. Uh, so. We're mostly known for this other project, though, called SecureDrop, which some of you may have heard about, originally created by Later and Schwartz. Now uh, we're the open source maintainers, and we get kind of uh, collaborative stuff going into it from all over the world, which is awesome. It's on GitHub as well. And then, of course, we do advocacy. This is a kind of joint uh, project that we have with the um, Committee to Protect Journalists called the Press Freedom Tracker, which uh, essentially logs physical attacks on the press in the US. Uh, definitely check that out. Uh, and then, of course, there's me. I'm one of the digital security trainers there. Uh, I also did a bunch of other stuff relating to art and technology, which is not super related to security, although sometimes it is. Uh, all the opinions expressed herein are my own and not those of my employer. Uh, and just a disclaimer that although there will be a lot of technical nuggets in this talk, this talk won't be so much about the technical details so much as it is about adding context to it. Uh, and with that note, I figure like the best way to add context is with a little bit of story time. These are all awful stories. These are all stories of bad things that have happened to really good people. Uh, so just something to keep in mind as I go through this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just dive right into uh, our first three. Uh, essentially, though, these are partially some that I've worked on or some, some that colleagues have worked on. Uh, we're not naming names, not because, like, they're in a better place security wise, but we kind of already had a lot of attention. They're kind of uh, at their quota for that. Um, so, we're just going to use these like pseudonyms. So, we have this like Eastern Bloc Media Org versus this Mystery APT. Who could it be? Uh, so, we have uh, this independent media outlet in a country where freedom of the press is, uh, exists on paper, but in practice doesn't really. A lot, of the, a lot of the organizations that have access to TV airwaves, to ac access to radio, to print, um, are very, very cozy with the states. And if you don't play ball with them, then you, know, you basically don't get to have an audience. Except, weirdly enough, carving out this exception for Facebook being one of those things that will let you have an audience in a, in a country like this, but also being something that's so popular for sharing baby photos that it can't ever be blocked. Um, so a lot of the staff are kind of scattered throughout the globe. They're all really busy. Some of them are in political exile because they're not you know, safe in their own country. Uh, and then, of course, there's kind of diving into like what actually happens. Um, and in this case, there was an old, you know, this is a Facebook page. There was an old Facebook account that had admin rights on it. Uh, it was just kind of forgotten about for a long time. And then uh, either the credentials were fished or they were like older and you know, reused passwords. Uh, and then once an attacker was able to get into it, was able to use that kind of admin rights, to use those admin rights to essentially uh, spam custom-made fake news to that media organization's page, thus creating this kind of like cloud of doubt and discrediting them. And it took them a long time to, and they're still recovering from that like mass unfollowing that followed. Uh, of course, you know, the, uh, 
recovery in this case that I was you know, involved in in this case was mostly just, uh, they had by now deleted the unused account, or at least they removed it from the admin rights, and then we had to go deal with Facebook to try to get that deleted. There were um, recommendations made for strong unique passwords, password managers to generate them and keep them. Uh, and then using a combination, this was a while ago, so using uh, U2F, so YubiKeys basically, and uh, some kind of software token, whether it be Google Authenticator, off the something along those lines, or page admins. Uh, and then also something that we don't talk about very much, which is just thinking about what the password recovery mechanism looks like and what the security around it looks like. So in many cases, including with Facebook, you have the idea of being able to recover your account through ownership of an email address. Um, and one would hope that's like ownership like OWN, owning it versus like PWN. Uh, and thinking about like whether that same level of two-factor authentication is available there is also something that was taken into consideration. So that was also created as part of this process. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook at the time made this a little bit difficult. Um, there was issues with uh, kind of an older design of what this looked like where it was just kind of cobbled in. It said like, hey, if you want to use 2FA, check out our Facebook app. It has it built in. You go to the app. It's not there. The documentation is wrong. What do you do? Uh, and then if you go back into the actual line linking to it, there's like one tiny gray line of text that has like the smallest link that leads to instructions on how to use it with, without the Facebook app. So that was um, a little bit frustrating. And, uh, but luckily we did get that set up. So that's really great. Uh, the new 2FA design massively improved the scavenger hunt aspect. This actually is what it looks like now. Uh, and just kind of to pause here, I would note that uh, thinking about security and users and the effectiveness of it generally is kind of this, this function of like how easy it is and that kind of leads into the result of how likely it is to actually be adopted. So it is a security feature to have usable design and just, you know, shout out to designers. So we have uh, here kind of the first part of it. So just like we're getting through, getting started it, and then uh, I had to recreate a fake Facebook account because I deleted mine a while ago. Uh, and then of course we have the security method preference. Uh, shows the authenticator app. The, the phone one is highlighted because I was just a little too trigger happy on the screenshot. Uh, so now it's set up, it's ready, and then it's like, all right, it's YubiKey time. Go through that, cool. Uh, and then when we go back in, because it's like, okay, what if we're testing for like future scenarios. It's like eventually your journalist is going to get a new phone and when that happens they're not going to have their, they're going to have to go through this like 2FA software app process again. What does that look like? So we were testing that. Uh, so you remove the authenticator app while the YubiKey as you can tell here is still there. It's totally there. The recovery codes are set. Like they have everything they need for another means of logging in. You hit remove and then the tiny, tiny, tiny text that nobody reads is that if you hit remove, it removes everything. It just starts over from scratch. Great. Um, so kind of going back to the importance of usable design, these are kind of things to think about is not just thinking about designing for the like first step into a system, but also like all the use cases that will be uh, entailed by somebody coming back to it due to different things like either getting your phone or losing their keys, for example. Cool. Uh, another terrible story is uh, this, uh, we also, at Freedom Press Foundation, we have a whole curricula around helping documentary filmmakers from a wide variety of uh, threat actors, uh, including uh, some very not fine people at Charlottesville. So the target here in this case uh, was a documentary team that was uh, doing some kind of research into these different hate groups and uh, the attack was basically a very kind of traditional um, social media reconnaissance and online harassment campaign followed by uh, doxing. So in this case, uh, getting at some of like the key or at least most visible documentary people in the team and trying to get their, tox their docs and their tears essentially. So the recovery in this case was a little bit interesting in that one of the things that I kind of learned on this job is that literally nobody knows what doxing is until it happens to them, uh, including most journalists. This is one of those things where like, we, in our circles, like, we know what that is. It's like one of the things that we think about even though we don't always design for it. But it's something that we know, the, we know is out there. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't. And this is a huge problem because if you don't know that there is something to protect yourself again, against, like how will you know to take the preventative measures to protect yourself? Uh, so anyway, 
So after this all happened, we went through and kind of recommended opt-out processes, a data broker delisting service, uh, as well as another thing that literally nobody's heard about, Twitter advanced search, which basically lets you retroactively go back into your timeline, look at your old tweets, and see if there's anything that's either uh, you know, too revealing or too spicy that you might want to delete. So essentially, that's kind of the, uh, and this is something that plays into the skills that journalists already have, as they are already people that investigate things. So this lends itself well to it. Uh, and this is not the uh, doxing of the journalist, but this is just kind of a good example of what that looks like in the real world. In this case, this was an activist from Ohio. Uh, so some of this stuff could be found through just social media reconnaissance and tools like data display. So that's like all the different kind of social media tie-ins that work based on like the contact lookup. And then you have kind of the more PII type stuff, uh, kind of like address, phone number, and stuff that can be bought essentially from a data broker site. Uh, and then kind of the more compromati kind of things at the bottom that sort of like reveal the strip club. So, and then, so that's like kind of one example of, of that. The third story is uh, one that I did not like work on personally, but that a few of my colleagues uh, did. Uh, and this was essentially this kind of more recent series of attacks against civil society in, uh, in Mexico, mostly using uh, NSO Group's Pegasus, which is a you know, spyware tool that's used to basically use ODAs to remote control somebody's uh, mobile device. Uh, these are kind of spread out in a few different areas. Um, there's a little bit of, if you read the Citizen Lab report, there's a lot of kind of back and forth on like, NSO group being like, well, our customers aren't in all these countries. I'm like, yeah, your customers aren't, but the IP space of your victims are. So that's basically what they mean in case there was some clarification needed on that front. Um, so we have, uh, what this actually looks like is uh, this text message that somebody gets. It's a custom tailored text message SMS that basically says like, oh my God, something urgent happened. You need to click on this right now. Uh, usually goes to a bit.ly link, which then goes to a uh, malware link, which then basically takes advantage of the exploit and takes over their phone. Um, unfortunately, there is, this is still an ongoing thing. Uh, this story has not ended. It's still a problem. Uh, the kind of response that came up out of that and a lot of the reporting that came out of it, including from the New York Times, was that there was a lot more kind of like public outcry in the area. Uh, there was a Gobierno Espia uh, political scandal that came out of that, which brought a little bit more awareness to the project. And my colleagues at R3D uh, had their own awareness campaign, uh, at least as much as they could. They did some really cool like gifts and stuff. So more people know about this uh, there now than they're used to, which is a good thing. Um, so anyway, so that was story time, and now we're going to kind of dive into the different kind of themes between all these different ones. So we'll notice that, like, none of these necessarily, like, I love working on encryption problems and the idea of, like, yeah, we well, need to make sure our messages are secure. Um, that's great. I would also think that there's other ways that journalists get attacked, and uh, we should be thinking about those as well. So we're going to go through kind of, like, the different kind of vulnerabilities and attack surfaces that they have. So password breaches. Uh, so we have... Uh, this, uh, this kind of like, not really a back door so much as just a really, really weak lock on a front door that we call passwords. Uh, we have, you know, a kind of mixed opinion from the internet on like, what is a good password? Every website will have kind of a different opinion on like, oh, your password's too weak. Oh, your password's totally strong. And a lot of that's been informed by like the security concerns of the 90s. It's like, oh, it doesn't matter if it's true. You can just like flip some like uppercase, lowercase letters, add a few symbols at the end. It's going to be fine. It's not. Um, there's been a lot of kind of analysis on like what passwords in the real world look like. Uh, Troy Hunt, of course, which you probably all know of, is, uh, has an older report that's still, I think, pretty relevant. That kind of gives you an idea of what like passwords in the real world look like. Uh, in this case, password attacks, we all know about them, you know, and 36% of these, uh, of the Sony breach in this case from 2011 contained a dictionary name as a, pa or dictionary word as a password, 50% uh, or less for eight characters were less than eight characters long, 67% reused a password that was also used in a separate breach, the uh, Gawker uh, breach in this case. So just to give you an idea of like how much it, this is a uh, problem out there. Uh, some people have kind of come up with ways to address that problem, which I recommend looking into if you're a developer. Um, and I know this isn't a Ruby convention, but I was, like I do some Ruby development, so I'll sprinkle in like, hey, this is a Rails gem, check it out. Um, 
So there is this thing called X, or sorry, ZXCVBN that is a kind of implementation of like, what if we kind of like sat down and thought through what makes a strong password and then created kind of a, a meter, a str universal strength meter that we can all use in, uh, for all these different things. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, there's also separately, there's the uh, Carnegie Mellon's Cups Lab also worked on uh, their own kind of password meter implementation, which is also open source, and you can just kind of plop right into your web app, which is really cool. Uh, there's a demo and code available for that here. And uh, there's also the idea of like using a pepper, which there's varied opinions on because uh, when there are like password breaches, you know, in many cases, like, or in some cases, you have this idea of just like, okay, somebody got access to what is available on a database, so like a user's table in the database, but not necessarily what might be in an application source code and what it might be in like an application server and its environment variables. Uh, and in this case, like Rails 5.2 has the encrypted credentials feature, which is really cool because it makes it so that you won't actually have this attack surface of thinking about keeping this into your source, in your source code or even an environment variable about use, by using basically what is essentially built in password manager for the application. Cool, so the other kind of attack surface, so doxing, uh, there's, uh, yeah, kind of going back to the fact that like nobody has heard of doxing it turns out. Uh, and we try to kind of like show people what this is and how to kind of mitigate the risk of that as much as we can and the FPF team is very busy and we go through like a thousand journalists a year trying to like tell them, hey, you should think about these things. Unfortunately, that's not everybody. So we should probably think about, you know, the power that platforms have and thus, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. What does responsibility look like in a platform? And in this case, not really like anything too fancy, honestly. Like in many of these platforms, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, there's always like a set of conditionals on like, what do you have filled in? oh, you don't have your, oh, you can't change your username on Facebook because you haven't added a phone number yet. In the same way, like, you know, we have access to all these indicators on whether or not somebody is a journalist. You don't really need, like, fa anything fancy. You just need to be able to search texts. And that will at least give you, like, a baseline of at least catching some people that match that criteria. Uh, I don't literally recommend, like, bringing back Clippy from the dead and having, like, Clippy show up in your Twitter and tell you to, uh, lock down your stuff and telling you all about the dangers of doxing, but you know, just throwing that out there. Uh, then there's the responsibility in newsrooms. Um, journalists are really, really busy, so if you ask them to take like a day doing something, chances are they'll put it off until the last minute or not do it. So it is a good idea from a newsroom site to like have a mandatory like day I set aside to work on that and or buying a delisting service. And if your newsroom's too cheap, you know, that's what unions are for. Cool, so then there's also phishing. Uh, extremely common tactic and it's only gotten more sophisticated. Uh, there's an amnesty report that kind of covers uh, a lot of what's happened more or less recently from like, uh, it was released I think December last year. And uh, a very, very recent one that's right off the press from CERTFA which talks about uh, attacks by state sponsored, uh, Iran state sponsored actors. Uh, so let's talk about some of these attacks. So you have this like, oh look, Proton Mail, it's unencrypted, it's Mr. Robot, that's what they use, right? It's super secure. Um, this is not a Proton Mail login page. Uh, it has HTTPS, it looks exactly like it, but if you notice, there's an E after Proton. So that's like kind of the thing that is easy for some of us to look out for, but I actually did not catch this the first time that I saw that screenshot. Separately, we have Tutanota, which this is tutanota.org. Seems about right. No, they don't have the .org domain, it turns out. They didn't buy it. So somebody else did, it was an attacker, and this looks exactly like uh, the regular Tutanota site. Um, and this is just kind of like thinking about, like I love working on like really cool, interesting, like people working on really cool, interesting future-proofing problems like quantum cryptography, but I think it's also important to look at the needs of the present and try to address those as well. So in many cases, kind of really just echoing what Amnesty, what CERTFA, what like literally everybody has already said uh, regarding all this, uh, U2F in this so hardware YubiKey is basically your best friend in this kind of situation. Uh, unfortunately, though, email is a little bit tricky on that regard. If you look at kind of like even privacy-focused email service, it's a little bit lacking. Tutanota has an option, but it's only in their kind of like desktop client that isn't even available through regular channels. So you have to basically download a, a beta application to uh, try it out. Uh, ProtonMail just doesn't have it. RiseMail doesn't have any 2FA. 
Um, and then of course there's kind of circling back to like, well, what do we do about SMS? Because that, like everybody has it, so it's just an instant attack surface on everybody's phone. Uh, and there's no like additional kind of 2FA bolted on top of that. But also it's not really that kind of issue. It's more of just like, please don't download malware issue. And uh, you know, we have like tweets from R3D from others kind of going in and saying like, don't click on spooky links. But it'd be cool if users could see that in the actual app that they're trying to defend. So I do wonder whether, you know, going back to great power, great responsibility, whether like responsibility on the side of a telephone company looks like a telephone company not only notifying you of like your late bill, but also of like potential scams that are out there. Uh, and also the idea of just like, there's things like Noma Robo, which deals with, uh, you know, scam calls essentially. It's like, should that, something like that exist for, uh, for Pegasus? That'd be cool, just saying. Cool, I'm gonna open up for questions if anybody has any. The uh, mics are over there and uh, elsewhere probably, I don't see the other one. Cool, uh, so, you touch. If you're one of the like 10 people that still use PGP, I also use that as well. So we're just like, you know, keep the faith alive. All right, peace.